Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 264. 264. Hola, amigos. Hope you guys are doing good. Great. Amazing. I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. I just came back from the gym. Had a good little weight session, overhead presses, back squats, deadlifts. Then I did a little nine minute wad of pull ups, push ups, and 12 kettlebell swings. Nine, six, nine sets of the of the first two and then 12 of the last one in a total of nine minutes i did a total of six rounds i'm feeling nice and fresh got a nice breakfast in me and we're going to attack this podcast as per usual if you're listening via the podcast app please leave me a five-star review so people can find the show it helps to spread awareness if you're watching via the youtube app or the youtube channel or whatever it may be smash that like button if you like what you're hearing click subscribe so you can come back another time um, as per usual, if you want to discover more things about myself, what I get up to, my stuff outside of YouTube, and all that malarkey, whether it be DJing, blog writing, all that other good stuff, check out my website, accidentalzinger.com. Be able to find it down below in the description of this video, or you can find it in the description of the podcast app when you just click more details. You'll be able to find it on there. So, I've um, got a lot to talk about. Most of the stuff I speak about on here is generally framed around streetwear, but you know, all of you know, different I, I kind of frame it under the streetwear umbrella because it's the easiest thing to kind of put it under but loads of other stuff in, concerning culture art design fashion music tv movies whatever it may be all falls under the umbrella speak about it for about an hour or so then i'll let you guys get on with your day um so got some topics to talk about here number one i'm getting into fantasy as some of you might have seen on instagram i've just got i've just downloaded i just bought this book on audible actually called the rage of dragons by evan winter I was trying to find a fantasy book to kind of get because it's gone screen properly. I was trying to find a book to get into fantasy for the first time because I've not really been a fan of it beforehand. But I was reading up or checking. I randomly stumbled upon some clips of actually um, Game of Thrones season eight. And I was so disappointed. Oh, obviously, we were all disappointed with that season. But just going back and watching some other clips from season four, season three, you're like, bloody hell, man, what an amazing story. You go ahead and you check out the Old Ship X channel, which kind of goes in deep on the books that George R. R. Martin writ um, regarding the Game of Thrones. And then you just kind of, you know, want to discover other books that maybe fall into that lane that you could also discover before they get a TV reboot, which would be something that I would like to do, especially with some of the other fantasy books I've discovered. And I went through that rabbit hole, stumbled upon the, the fantasy subreddit. And on that subreddit, I was kind of informed that the book to kind of read to kind of really get me into um, discovering fantasy or rediscovering fantasy and reading those kind of books was to kind of do something more along the lines of of this Evan Winter book called, um, like I said, um, was it? Yeah, The Rage of Dragons. So I'm really looking forward to checking that out. So I recommend if you are uh, as obsessed with reading those kind of books as I am or you want to get involved before the reboot starts, I recommend you check it out. Um, the dude seems pretty interesting as well. He's got a pretty cool interview out, I think, with this guy called Daniel Green on YouTube too. You should check out who's a really cool um, YouTuber or booktuber in the fantasy sort of um, sector. So definitely give that a little try. Um, what else have I been checking out for the time being? Oh, um, movies, actually. I'm not the biggest movie buff in the world, but I've been watching a lot more in the last couple of days just because I want to get... I want to end the year... Um, I want to I wanna basically end this year drowning myself or covering myself in every kind of a you know creative expression that exists out there i'm just head going in deep watching documentaries listening to mixes recording stuff writing stuff creating things i just want to end this year big i want to do as much as i can so i can feed into and kind of overflow into the new year so i've been watching loads of movies taking notes um, regurgitating that stuff writing my own stuff just you know just trying to be as creative as i can possibly can and one way that i did it was going through a list of movies i've always kind of saved in my bookmarks i've never kind of gotten um I've never got around to kind of watching. And one of those movies is Anna. Um, Anna is an action movie, basically in the same way that you were, um, that you would, uh, I would describe it as, what's that one with them? Um, where his daughter always goes missing. Liam Neeson for movie. What's that movie called? Uh, Liam Neeson movies. What's that thing called? What's it called? Taken. Yeah, so Anna is in the same form as Taken. Um, the idea is you've got this one protagonist, which is this model who who, who is, is a model undercover as a KGB agent who kind of goes around assassinating the targets. And then through that story, she kind of reaches a boiling point across all that she has to decide whether or not she wants to live in this continuing 
kind of prison uh, being a kgb um, assassin where she can't leave or she wants to live in a prison as being a model you know where you're constrained to what's just in front of the lens so it's this kind of existential story where she kind of discovers herself through the process of killing loads of people very interesting and very bizarre but once you read into the story a little bit deeper you understand that the actual main um, actor of this movie um anna is actually a former model herself, a professional, you know, legit runway model called Sasha Lush, who was, I think, discovered by the director in order to play this role. And now she's um, kind of got this goal in her head that she actually wants to win an Oscar, um, which is, you know, surprising when you see a performance in Anna. It's not the strongest performance in the world, but still there's some kind of scope in there. There's some, um, you can see some talent, some range in her. So it's just cool to see somebody doing a role like Anna for the first time, especially being a former model and straight away coming in it with some, you know, heady goals. Like she wants to win an Oscar. Whether she just, she wins it anyway isn't really the point. The point is she's having, she's come from one arena in fashion and completely pivoted into this, you know, acting world that is, you know, cutthroat. There's no favors there. For the most part, acting is probably worse than probably modern out modeling, I'd say for the most part. If you're a model and you've got the swag and you generally have the look, you can book most of the jobs, but in acting, it doesn't really matter that you're the best actor. Um, sometimes movies just don't work out due to other external factors, whether it's the production company, whether it's the agent owes somebody a favor so they get someone else a role instead of you, even though you, re you read really well and you audition really well. So it's other things that play that would result in you get, not getting a job. And I would imagine too, there is probably a plethora of attractive blonde girls that work in Hollywood that don't get any jobs because, you know, maybe nowadays with the whole... Um, light being shone on probably representing more uh diverse and maybe marginalized uh communities maybe being a white blonde girl isn't necessarily the best look that you want nowadays so it's a bit it must be quite tricky for her but i still commend her courage and her forthrightness and kind of going for it and this short little interview on vulture speaks upon what i'm speaking about now the I'll quickly read it to you now. The, the article is titled Sasha Lush is, is a movie star now and she's given herself five years to get an Oscar. So incredible to see. And this is a scene from one of the first sort of um, action clips or sort of like action sequences that you'll see in the movie. Anna. And I recommend you check it out. If you're a fan of Taken, don't expect any like highbrow Michael Scorsese sort of like, you know, type storytelling. But if you like action and you like really cool combat scenes, I really recommend you check it out. I think she even trained Muay Thai and, and MMA for this as well. So you, um, I really commend her from again just being a, a, your average run of the day model if you've ever seen a model run you'll know that this is a big deal models run really horrible so the fact that she's able to kind of you know um, beat people up in this movie and make it look convincing is really good so I really can, I can check it out so the the title of Argos is the following um, Sasha Lush is virtually is in virtually every scene in Anna the R-rated um, Locke Benson action flick about a supermodel turned super assassin that finally opens after a series of delays related to sexual assault allegations made against his director. This month, the movie charts uh, the titular characters rise from the Russian street urchin to professional killer, the kind who can take down a bear-sized mobster with a fork to the neck or disembowel four assailants using um, dinner plates. Luss's favorite scenes occur when Anna, in a fit of peak pistol whips, an arrogant fashion photographer with nothing but his own camera, snapping photos of the hood couture humiliation as it happens. Models are just going, are going to love me for this, she says. Over the past decade, Russian-born Lush has become one of the most sought-after models in the fashion industry. But uh, the catwalk has never really been her end goal. The Vogue covers girl, that's amazing, she was even a Vogue cover girl, amazing, turned 27 last week. I'm on this 27, like 35 in model years because they, whenever they say ages like that, I always get the feeling that they're kind of subliminally saying that she's too old to model, which is really bizarre, isn't it? Um, spent her birthday at the wizarding world of Harry Potter, began her career as a professional stage performer as early as, as an age of eight. She was taking parts in plays like Jonathan Livingston Seagull. She played an abortion angel in the Moscow production. Living in New York for the past several weeks, she's continued to study acting with the acclaimed drama coach Susan Batson, the one Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise acknowledging respective awards acceptance speeches. The world simply wasn't made aware of her talents until a chance scouting by a controversial French filmmaker, which is the part of the reason why I guess Anna didn't get the... Um, press that it should have got because the directors got embroiled in a bit of, in some sexual sexual assault allegations which is always you know disappointing for the people that are acting in the movie 
um, especially nowadays with you know a lot of the kind of attention being pointed towards the, the sorry the victims and you know you have to believe all victims so a lot of that kind of initial steam initially goes wears off on the director they have to answer a lot of questions and usually the production company doesn't want to put them in front of the cameras or to hurt the movie's chances in the box office but for the most part there's so much content out there that you really have to get that person who directs it or who stars in it to kind of be front and center that's why even even nowadays with the you know with social media being what it is you're still seeing people like kevin hart and the rock you know hitting every single market doing every single interview under the sun in order to kind of gain exposure for their movie because you know without doing those kind of circuits no one's really going to care or bother to watch your movie and again i stumbled upon anna because i happened to be watching a movie in the cinema it was one of the trailers i played beforehand and i'm also one of those geeks that will write shit, stuff down and then go and google it later some people might just check it and say oh my god that looks like a cool movie they'll they'll try and remember it and then obviously once you leave the cinema you completely forget it on your way to go get, grab a burger so I really feel sad for in that regard, isn't it? Um, that she kind of got cast in the movie by a guy that obviously sought her out, that wanted to give her a chance, but now he's also embroiled in this sort of like sexual assault scandal stuff. Um, Anna director Benson is known for um, habitually stocking his thrillers with visually gonzo sci-fi, gonzo sci-fi films with models. Just as he was casting the Valerian in a city of thousand planets, he came across Lush's image in a magazine and reached out to her modeling and she's amazing, right? So that's the reason she's actually doing it in real life. The two met the day after the director's father died and Lust says their conversation inevitably got heavy about family relationships months later they met again in Paris for a four hour audition during which um, Lush um, sang a cappella and spoke in an alien language of her own creation wow he tortured me she says he got the job she got the job in her debut role Princess Lilo Mania in the 20th century planet Mule a trippy looking humanoid with alabaster skin curly blue eyes and a monk bald pate whose ultimate untimely death at the hands of the marauding aliens sets the movie's plot in motion. Um, over the course of seven days at New Zealand's renowned special effects company, Mueta Workshop, the actress says she got to know Benson. It was it was me, Luck, and his wife was a producer on the set. Lush recalls during a recent visit to Los Angeles in fluent Russian accent English. Luck was always asking questions. He knew why I was, that I was frustrated with modeling. By that moment, it was not interesting anymore. She was like, he was so he was like is acting something you're serious about and i was like yeah very much and he was like how do you see your life in five years in five years she said i'm going to have an oscar he was like you don't sound like a girl who was shot a little scene in a big movie but let's see if what can help you so that's amazing to see in it like i would imagine as well being that's that that's a problem i guess with modeling in it as with most niche um industries the come up is probably quite interesting and a little bit difficult and requires you to go to the gym work out you know put your name out there go to random castings and hustle 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 but i guess once you reach the pinnacle you start doing the vogue covers and stuff that's basically the apex of the mountain there's not there's not much room to go from there right and as the years go by your stock seems to like dwindle especially if you're not some of the elite you know five to ten models who are still working in the older age for the most part so you're constantly having to battle with the younger kids in an industry that you probably don't really care about but i guess the good thing about modeling is that i've heard that a lot of the women, especially nowadays, or um, you know, for the for the beginning of time, basically, women earn a disproportionate amount more modeling than than men do. So if men get paid fifty thousand, a woman's going to get paid half a mil for that same um, shoot, which you know they're well deserving of getting. So there is this idea that you can earn a big lick, you can make a lot of money, and obviously, if you don't have any, you don't have any vices, and you're a fairly stable person, and you got your head screwed on right, you can go in there earn a lot of money save it and then go and pursue your other dreams but the only issue i'd see with modeling in that regard is that it steals your youth and it steals the time that you kind of have to kind of mess around and kind of figure stuff out so by the time you kind of pop out the other side imagine if you get into modeling when you're 21 by the time you pop out the other side and you're at 27 28 you've essentially wasted a lot of the time that you would have been figuring life out in that middle bit so now you have to figure life out just before you turn 30 and if there's anything more scary than figuring life out before turning 30 it's trying to figure it out when you're 28 and you're a former model and you don't have any life experiences you're going to come out of it f like not like fully unequipped right you've been babied for the most of your life by your agency they basically book all your jobs for you they sort out your accommodation sort out your travel um you have a very insular or kind of uh yeah insular kind of friendship group that don't really partake in the real world you are smoozing and uh, you know with uh, with the higher ups of society and to suddenly be spouted the other side now you have to kind of fend for yourself in the outside world must be a real trip must be a real trip especially nowadays again like i'm saying with you know there's so much competition coming at you when you're modeling right from this gets some random girl in some nowhere town on instagram 
to this established person who's now kind of rejigging herself and placing herself in a more of a younger space, i.e. Naomi Campbell, right? You're competing with Naomi Campbell who's now figured out how to do YouTube and she's absolutely smashing it. And you're also competing with the girl on Instagram. So I really commend this girl for going this direction. It's really cool to see. And again, it's it's also nice that you have somebody that's able to kind of guide you down this process in this, act, in this director, uh, Luc Besson. Meanwhile, um, Lus not only continued to work on her acting, but endeavoured to write her own screenplays too, which is always a thing you have to do, I think. I think it's the same. I'm even seeing it with, with my DJing work. As as great as I'm as great as I'm doing with the DJ gigs at the moment, I've got you know gigs coming out of my ass. I'm being approached by people to go and play places, which is amazing. You still have to be a triple threat. You have to be able or a double threat. You have to be able to DJ and you have to be able to produce. It's just one of those things. You have to be able to, and it and maybe even be good at social media. That might be the triple threat. And I guess when you're acting, it's the same thing. And maybe just to kind of advance your acting, you have to maybe do things that you're not good at. That's where the ten thousand hours kind of gets thrown out the window. What actually separates the good to the great? Is that they have the they have a they have a basically a coach, right? If you're a tennis star and you're Roger Federer, you might not practice as much as you know some guy in the park. But what you have the advantage of is a is a basically a coach who's able to analyze your footage or just see you in real life and tell you to kind of bring your elbow down a little bit. Those little tweaks is what's going to make you jump up several notches than the regular guy playing in the park. And I guess maybe screen writing a screenplay is the same thing for an actor. Like the idea that you're able to kind of understand that side of movie making would then inevitably help you in front of the screen. I would imagine in front of the camera. I would imagine so. I don't know. I've never really done acting in that regard. So I don't know if that's true, but hopefully that is true, which is what compelled her to reach out to Besson, Besson a few months after the Valerian production wrapped up to request some of his shooting scripts. He knew what I, that I'm writing a lot and asked him, May I please have a few screenplays, like my maybe The Fifth Element or something, so I could just see how you write. That's when he sent me Anna. I was like, wow, I never heard of it. And he said, yeah, because it's new. Then he's like, would you want to be the role of Anna? The upshot, the kind of shoot em up Cinderella story that fits into the Atomic Blade, Red Sparrow and Salt family of espionage tales. Oh yeah, Salt was another good one as well that I quite enjoyed. Despite an almost total absence of acting bona fides, Lust inhibits a starring role in a 30 million Anna, holding her own in the high octane ass kicking scenes as well as in the dialogue heavy sequences of Oscar winner Helen Mirren who portrays Anna's techno bullshit KB, KGB overseer oh it's Helen Mirren okay cool no wonder she's so good to, to physically prepare for to play a character who's lethal in jiu-jitsu grappling and Muay Thai kickboxing Anna trained um, with the film's choreographer up to six hours a day five times a week for two months then she continued a grueling regime throughout principal photography i knew they were going to do a lot of fighting scenes i'm not a very sporty person i have a dancing background which i thought would help it didn't <laughs> Lust says physically it was hard it was long it was exhausting a lot of people ask me who got beaten up the most and i'm like me like that's but it's amazing if you watch actually the action scenes from the movie she's very convincing like you couldn't be able to you wouldn't tell that she's not a very sporty person she definitely uh, is able to kind of pull it off really well um it's the kind of star making performance that should be familiar to besson's com uh, com completist he's long introduced audiences to unknown actresses future resident advise frigid resident um evil franchise face mila jo jovich in the fifth element uh 13 year old natalie portman in the professional and french superstar uh and balois in the 1990 La Femme, Nikita, the British supermodel Cara Delevingne, had only appeared in Suicide Squad before she had Lion Besson's Valerian. Scarlett Hansen, who plays the telepathic telekinesian mental time traveler in previous to Pain in Besson's 468 Ghost Million film Lucy, was already quite famous by the time Besson cast her. No word yet whether she'll appear in the movie's rumored sequel. Okay, that's great to see. The sequel coming up too, but. Definitely recommend you check it out. So one of the, it's a great movie. I really enjoyed it. High octane drama, loads of kick ass action scenes, and again, a really cool way for an actress or a former model to kind of segue into acting, which is you know very difficult profession. But again, more power to her. She has a goal of getting an Oscar in five years, and who's to say it won't happen? Credit credit to the girl. So moving on. What do we have here? We also have Jack Master. Jack Master is back. Um Jack Master did a little interview actually with um uh with what's it with Vice? with vice magazine which i thought was fairly interesting and a fairly informative interview um jack master has gone through a lot man it's been a tough year for the guy um and it seems like he's still struggling with everything that's happened if you're not familiar i think last year he was embroiled in a sexual harassment uh scandal at love stays a day festival supposedly he got too messed up and he essentially went and started grabbing random girls around the 
spent around the green room, ended up picking up a couple of girls that work for Love Saves a Day. Then I think what actually caused the issue wasn't what he'd done, the act, because I think the girls were fairly understanding that he was completely out of his nut and they forgave him pretty quickly, I think, because he apologized in person and all that stuff. But I think the fallout from it was what was set up, what upset the girls in question because it was assumed that it was some kind of jokey laddie thing when they didn't think it was funny at all. Then the story kind of transpires that I spoke about in another video about him supposed to be defecating a kettle and that was what set it off. And loads of really silly things that came out of it that kind of... I would say uh, didn't treat the issue with as gravi the the, gravi the gravitas that it kind of deserved. So I guess with that, that kind of then made Jack Master look bad. I guess for the people that were not fans of his, anyways, it made it seem like he wasn't apologetic. That he was only saying sorry because he was scared of losing his career, which is not a bad thing either. I think if he worked, you know, if 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 you know anything about if there's a, if there's one thing we know about scenesters or we know about living in a hipster kind of area is that. You're always going to bump into a photographer, a stylist, and a DJ, right? Those are three pre pre professions for the most part that are oversubscribed, that, you know, that everyone and their friend knows somebody that can fall into those three groups. So for you to kind of suddenly emerge from that urethra of those options and kind of do it this professionally, it means that you've worked really hard for it. So for you to kind of do anything in your power to dumb down a controversy or to make it seem not that much of a big deal so you don't lose your career. I'm not sure if it's that bad. I'm not sure if it's that bad of a thing. You know, you're well living your right to try and save a career that, not, that a lot of people would want and a lot of people would kill for. So I don't really blame him for that. But, you know, as it is, the internet went a bit crazy with it. Um, but he's tried to make amends. He essentially went away from the scene, disappeared for maybe close to a year. I saw him pop up a little bit on people's Instagrams here and there, but he wasn't really posting much on his own social profile, but he was playing random sets here and there, mostly in Ibiza. People didn't really give a toss, but he wasn't getting announced on flyers. He wasn't playing big sets. He wasn't doing a kind of comeback tour. Nothing was happening. And I thought for the most part, the reason why that was was because he went to rehab. And I guess it has because he's been to AA. He's essentially done a lot of self-discovery and tried to make amends or to kind of get his career back. But it still seems like people are, um, are hesitant to kind of give him a chance. But he's made this, but um, Vice decided to kind of sit down with him and kind of speak about what happened. And I guess because it's the end of the year, he, I'm assuming he wants to kind of um, make amends again so he can make a big jump for it in the new year. Because I assume the only reason why his interview is happening because in the background, I'm assuming most of the venues and the booking promoters and stuff are, you know, keeping an arm's distance from him because they don't want to get bombarded on socials or on, you know, for the most part, you know, on social media for booking this guy. No one wants that kind of backlash. So they're trying to let it kind of kind of die down, which I thought it died down already, but I guess it kind of, there's still people holding out. So maybe this is like a public um, show of remorse or regret so that he can hopefully then get his career back. But again, it just throws up some interesting questions as to how long does a person need to be out of the spotlight to redeem themselves and what is a path to redemption? Let's say he is sorry. Let's say he did a bad thing. And again, it was, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, as, it, it, it was bad, but it didn't go as far as it probably could have. And if it did go as far as that, is there a way back to redemption? Like what are the degrees of forgiveness? Like do we end it at just, you know, maybe unwanted touches? Does it go as far as actually trying to do something? Um, what are the very levels of punishment that come into it? And again, who is the judge? Um, if the girls are forgiven him, should we have forgiven him as a scene and just kind of move on from it? Is it up to the promoters to decide? Is it up to the customers to decide? If people buy tickets to his events, does that mean he's back in the everyone's good graces? I don't know. Let's just read a bit of the interview now to get a bit of an idea on what's going on. This is an interview from Vice. The title is, It Was All My Fault, Jack Master Breaks His Silence. We spoke to a Scottish DJ a year after his public apology for sexually harassing staff while on GHB at Love Says the Day Festival. So here's him there um, looking quite, I don't know, gaunt and a little bit, you know, empty in the eyes, I guess. It's been a tough time. Sitting down with Vice also isn't the most, I think, advisable thing. They do have a tendency to do a lot of hit jobs on people. But again, I don't think there's any... He probably can't fall any lower than he has now. So he probably just thinks, you know what? It's a Hail Mary. Let me just sit down with these guys and see what they're going to say. Um, and I'm sure, and I'm sure, you know, sitting down with a... It looks like a female, Anna Cordea Rado, and kind of talking about this stuff. What was kind of brutal, opening his kind of wound. So again, he's probably vulnerable, but, you know, what can he do? He's probably trying to save his career. So I've lost sympathy in that regard. And again, credit to Vice for actually giving me a platform to kind of speak about it too, because I wouldn't expect it from them. I would expect they would be kind of in the, in the F Jackmaster camp, but that was commendable for them. This interview says the following. 
Uh, do men who apologise for sexual harassment get their careers back? Jack Master Revel or Jack Revel, sorry, the Scottish DJ known as Jack Master certainly hopes so. It's the middle of July afternoon and Revel and I are sitting in the basement club of a restaurant near London Fields, a park in Hackney. It's musky and damp and the harsh overhead lights illuminate the space around us. Revel, who's wearing a pristine white button-up shirt and a healthy glow, looks slightly out of place. As we talk, he's visibly anxious. His eyes are wide. He's fiddling with a pen and pens and paper with typed out notes. He's quick to emphasize. He's brought the notes, not because he has a script, but because we're here to talk about it is difficult. And he needed to get his thoughts in order before we spoke. The shame and the guilt I feel from this. He starts before trailing off. I find it really hard to even talk about because I'm just so ashamed. Which again is really commendable and really honorable of the dude. I think it goes to show that he's a decent guy. I think we've seen enough... See, we, I think we've seen enough rubbish, shitty apologies from people, especially men, when they're embroiled in these sexual harassment suits, to know when we hear somebody that is um, generally remorseful and does have a lot of regret with it. And again, I think in the space of electronic music, in the space of dance music, in the space of underground techno culture, house, whatever it may be, we have seen many of these instances before where somebody has overstepped the mark, overstepped their line, got a bit comfortable, and has been, you know, quite unre been non unremorseful about the whole issue, kind of, you know, chalked it off as just boys being boys and kind of continue doing what they do. And we've seen it and it's disgusting. So to, for Jack Master and his kind of stature to sit there and be really remorseful about it so much so that he doesn't want to say anything wrong he's typed out some notes in order to make sure he clarifies his thoughts um i i think he's i think he's i think he's trying really honestly trying to get his career back and really trying to make it known that he's really really sorry about what happened and i guess the the fallout from it was um you know again was not desirable i think the way it was handled post again was quite hard for probably to do he was probably still high still drunk at the time the way it kind of unfolded wasn't the best thing but i think the fact that the girls involved in it were the ones that forgave him first and that were the ones that were understanding the situation says a lot i think for the most part if they felt as if it was unsincere and it didn't come from a real place i think they would have taken it to the very end and the fact that they were quickly quick to say look we understand it was a one-off thing but don't let it happen again was pretty um commendable for the girls themselves because again there's opportunity there to be a victim to earn some brand new points on social media but again i didn't hear them talk about themselves i didn't even I, I don't even know what the girls names are for the most part so again it goes to show that i think behind the scenes he did the necessary work to kind of make sure the ones that were hurt the most knew that he was sorry for what he did um continues on here uh, da, da, da. this is the first interview Ravel has given since he was accused of sexual assault and love says the day festival in may 2018 bloody hell man it's been more than a year female staff members at a british bristol festival alleged that after coming off stage Ravel, who was high and off the class c drug gsb at the time attempted to grab and kiss them against their will in a statement given to resident advisor one of the victims said jack's behavior on the night towards me crossed the boundaries of accessibility regardless of the fact that he's clearly off his head Revel subsequently issued a statement to the same website in which he admitted his behavior had been abusive and that he had acted lewdly and inappropriately towards numerous members of staff during a drug-induced blackout. Now, the one thing I'll say about this whole thing is that we are, we are we're not going to be naive enough or you know um yeah naive enough to suggest that Jack Mars is the only guy getting completely off his head while behind a deck DJing, right? We know of many DJs in our local scene, many DJs in the professional circuit who essentially use djing as a basically a mask in order to kind of get high um and get off in different countries with other people with themselves whatever it may be that we know is a thing right it's part and parcel of electronic dance music but i guess the good thing to come out of this really heinous situation is that i feel as if since that situation went down with jack master a lot of the people in the scene guys and girls who are bad badly behaved who go to dj sets who go to parties that you know and get paid high booking fees and then you know turn in absolutely horrendous sets because they're waste of their heads have now kind of fixed up their act i'm not sure if you guys have seen a little trend in here but i've seen a lot of trends especially within jack master's immediate circle of people he used to hang around with or people he used to dj with back to back i'm not going to name any names but i can tell a lot of those guys and girls have fixed up their acts a lot of them are going to sets and because i've I've long, I've long kind of battled with this myself, playing in my my little DJ sets in bars and pubs, around the kind of balance between getting high and getting drunk, and also DJing sober and playing a good set. Because sometimes the, the I think as I've read in the Craig Richards um, 
interview the art of djing a resident advisor he says something really illuminating where he says the idea of getting up on stage or behind a dj booth and playing music for people that isn't your own is a very unnatural thing right it doesn't come natural to you you feel a bit awkward the first couple of times right so which is probably why a lot of us feel kind of cringy when we see these sort of like tech house djs with their hands in the air you know going on as if like you know they're creating this music live on the spot when they're just playing other people's music it feels a bit nonsense it feels a bit like you're play acting because you know for the most part you know anyone could do the job that you're doing it's not that difficult of course you know there's very competent djs out there but for the most part djing is you know it's a fairly easy job to do if you're you know if you've got any kind of taste about you um and you're willing to practice so once you get up there it's very unnatural so that so it, that's why it encourages maybe bad behavior whereas drinking taking drugs to kind of level you out somewhat and also the idea of being in a nightclub i think it's similar to a, a comedian i've heard comedians say all the time you know they might take a shot of whiskey and a beer before they go up on stage it's fairly unnatural to go to a comedy club stand on stage and start telling jokes in front of strangers right and hoping that they laugh at your jokes in order to kind of calibrate yourself to the room you might want to inebriate yourself you might want to take some class a substances class b class c whatever they may be just to kind of level you out and bring you um kind of get you in tune with everyone around you so but obviously th that can be abused that can go too far and i think nowadays i think from my own personal opinion i think dance music electronic music underground music club culture has gotten so big has gone to a stage now where I think the proponents, the kind of people who are in charge of bringing it forward or driving it forward, promoters, label owners, club owners, um, bar owners, DJs, producers, they have to now step up their game. You, you you shouldn't be allowed to get away with what you were getting away with previously, turning up to gigs super smashed. You have to turn up and be a professional, be a class act, deliver a good show and make it worth people's money, especially in the days of people playing paying like warehouse project and print works prices to go see people play i would hate to go warehouse project in manchester pay 35 pounds to go see a group of djs and have half of them completely off their heads on md on coke whatever it may be on ket and then not get a good experience i want to be i want to go to a show and be entertained and then of course after the gig if you want to go and do whatever you want to do after fair enough but i think the idea of going turning up to a set especially on a dj booth wasted isn't the right way to go about things i know for, for, for first i know um Berghain, recently had an issue with um, that Kobolsi, Kobolsi, I haven't pronounced his name, where he was kind of essentially doing racks of lions behind the DJ booth and being a bit of a lad. And he essentially got banned from playing at the Bergheim because they don't tolerate that behavior. Because again, it's a professional place of work, right? It's the apex of the mountain in electronic music. You go there to go and kind of um, show off your talents to the greater world. And people that are going to rave, they're also professional ravers, professional club kids. There's a different level of expe expectation. And I think you have to do the same thing when it comes to festivals, when it comes to just regular club nights. You can't go there and act the way that Jack Master did. Now, honestly, think, since the fallout of this whole issue, I don't see think people have fixed up their, their their kind of behavior. And for the most part, I rarely, if ever, see people behind the booth super wasted and acting a fool. For the most part, everyone sort of raised their game and become a lot more professional and just done the job that they're meant to do, delivered a good show. And then after the fact, if you want to go back to a green room, go to an after party, go back to your hotel room and rail lines of people's bums, more than welcome to. But I honestly think nowadays with the prices people are paying, with the flights people are taking, you really should, you really do owe the fans and yourself put on a good show. And the only way to do it really, in my experience, is to do it relatively sober. Um, it continues here. Um, ever since Ravel's career has been on high haters, the DJ has focused on making amends. We're here to talk about what happens next. And the GHB thing is a weird one. I only saw people really taking a lot of that in Berlin. It's really big, it seems like, in the gay scene. Um, again, not, not something that I would be that um, uh, interested in doing. You have to do it in very particular doses or it can effectively kill you. And I'm not really chasing the high to that extent. But again, I can imagine what it must be like for a touring DJ, flying all over the world, the pressures of performing, free flights in one day, going in front of different people, different communities, um, maybe non-receptive crowds you might need to numb yourself to a little bit and again that's where um bodies or kind of support groups for mental awareness mental health um drug abuse drug safety you need to come in and really kind of help these especially younger ones come in, especially now where they're trying to focus a light on representing more diverse djs from diverse backgrounds who aren't necessarily had the experience of you know djing to thousands of people in the first place to go from playing to a hundred to a thousand that must be a bit of a mind fuck so they must need they must need to be some kind of support system there to help them through it. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, a few hours after he's set, 
at the festival reveal tells me he woke up on the floor in a trashed hotel room he'd been sedated and when he came to came to it a friend recounted the events the night before my heart sank and we've all been there man like when someone tells you what you got up to the night before when you have no idea what happened it's like oh that sinking feeling of embarrassment you just can't you just want want the you want the floor to just you know open up and swallow you whole. Um, it's been over a year since that night, and Ravel can only recall snippets of what happened. The last thing he remembers is picking up a female festival worker in what he says intended to be a jokey way, and dropping her result her injuring her arm. Bloody, I didn't know that bit as well. She fucked up her arm. Okay, that's not cool. Um, when he was told he that he proceeded to grab the woman and try to kiss her and that he then bounced from woman to woman trying to kiss them he says he just didn't believe it one of the first things i did was phoning up one of my women so i one woman and point black denying it one of the first things i did was in point black denying it he says revel regrets that now as we talk despite still not remembering the events firsthand he describes the staff members account as fact the truth of what actually happened including the parts that he doesn't that don't paint him in the best light is something revel doesn't want to clear up that's what the crap sorry in august 2018 three months after the harassment he posted a vague statement on his facebook page in which he said he had behaved inappropriately and offensively to staff at the event was heavily intoxicated again that was the one i think messed up i think when you if you're going to apologize for these kind of things and you are actually remorseful you do want to make amends the, what we've learned so far from the crappy apologies is that you have to point blank even from the youtubers you have to point blank come out lay out on the table and say look i'm completely wrong i messed up and here 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 and i'm going to try and do better you just have to be honest about it you can't sugarcoat it you can't try and explain yourself out of it you can't do that whole thing that people say oh if you were offended by it then i'm sorry kind of thing the apology not apology sort of thing you just have to come out flat out and say look this is what i've done wrong list them from one to ten one to twenty however long it may be and say i'm going to try and make amends this won't happen ever again that's all you can hope to do and then you have to wish on the lucky stars that you are not a reprehensible character i think we've seen with, with the nina kravitz and her cane roll stuff if you're someone that people don't like, they're going to look at any reason just to cancel you anyway. So you have to hope that you're not an unliked person. If you're not unliked, then you should be pretty fine. Um, I think, again, Jack Master, for the most part, I've, I've heard only good things about him from the scene. People have always said he's a pretty cool guy. So I guess it was just that first apology that made it seem like he was trying to protect his back. That kind of, you know, and again, if you're the girl reading him, reading those vague statements, you're like, no, hold on. You did more than act inappropriately. Do you know what I mean? You tried to get my bum. You tried to kiss me. You dropped me on the floor. I fucked up my arm. You know what I mean? Like, you were going around being a nuisance. We had to sedate you. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can, I can imagine that being really annoying. Uh... The, 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 the lack of detail sent the internet rumor mill into overdrive and theories circulated online and in industry circles. Obviously, I perpetuated it with my video too, so I'll hold my hands up on that one. There was one rumor that he defecated in a kettle, which I kind of perpetuated. That morphed into a conspiracy theory that it was actually Ravel's team who cooked up the kettle story to deliberately obfuscate obf 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 the real nature of what he'd done. Ravel denies all this. He says he's disturbed by the rumors that came out in the days and weeks after the event, but recognizes that by not issuing a clear enough statement at the time, he inadvertently found the internet flames. There was a rumor on the internet that I broke a girl's arm out of force. That isn't true. He tells me that hurting women at all, let alone by force, was something that he thought was he was incapable of doing. To hear he did it in a drug-induced haze shocked him into finally addressing his GBH uh, problem. My drug abuse was fine with me personally, which is always uh, the fact, isn't it? I think... That's when you know you're an addict and you have to probably seek help when your drug abuse or drug activity starts to impact other people negatively, I guess, in that regard. And you start to do things that you probably wouldn't do if you're sober. Um, I think we've all been that line down that kind of road. I think for the most part, for me, with alcohol, I've tended to kind of always give myself at least in a year, three to two to four months of sobriety, whether it's through sober October, whether it's through dry January, just these um, forced occasions where you kind of have to address your kind of indulgence in those kind of things to kind of let yourself know that you're not dependent on it because i think that's the path that i don't want to be down you know monday to friday for the most part i don't drink and then we're going a weekend i might have a couple of drinks so i'm not dependent on it i'm not waking up to having to have a glass of whiskey in order to kind of get through my day and i don't need to have a drink in order to go to a bar to enjoy myself right i put myself in enough situations as it is in my life where i know that i've been in bars and clubs and nightclubs completely sober and I had a good time that i'm fairly okay with it um but yeah so it continues here but again, it's something you always have to address. And it's really difficult on the nightlife scene, man. Part of the reason why nightlife is so fun is that you get to meet people you don't necessarily would meet, you wouldn't meet in regular everyday life. 
with the kind of you know undercurrent of everyone kind of drinking being a bit loose being a bit more friendly and talking to each other and you get this kind of exchange of high low right different collaborations spawn out of it different friendships different relationships just internal you it kind of rich enriches your life this is probably why a lot of people love to go to those kind of sceny industry after party things in you know during fashion week because you get the ability to kind of interact with different different kind of people within the industry and you get to put names to faces shake some hands you know i, I can see why that's an interesting place to be um da, 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 da. my drug abuse was finding me personally when i was hurting myself um even when i put myself in a coma and selfishly put my brother family and members and close friends through having to watch me nearly die but the moment i hurt other people i hurt these women this is very hard for me to reconcile myself with. By the time uh, the, of the harassment, Ravel already knew he did this is the GHB. He tried to stop a number of times before. For his 30th birthday, Ravel threw a party for thousands of people in, in Glasgow. He collapsed on stage after taking the drug. An ambulance was called. I had a tube down my throat, and this was all in front of a younger brother. He was in tears, thinking I was going to die. Bloody hell, man. Imagine that. That's grim. I, I didn't know it was that. I, I knew he liked to have a good time. I knew he liked to get on it, but I didn't know it was that bad. I remember... This is what happened to um who's the guy from um one of Jamie Jones's friends? What's his name, man? He was he's like that, right? I think he got banned from coming from the UK. I think now he's he's back, but I remember I think he got deported for that, like just being too fucked up at night. So I remember hearing some people throwing parties and booking him for a party. I've got his name, man. And he kind of never turned up to the event. They walked up to his hotel and he was completely mung down in the bed and they just had to get somebody else to play for him. Um that can be really annoying. And I guess as well for the people around you too, man. Like you go from that's a problem. Like, that's why everyone's watched that Avicii documentary. The pressures of that's a pre I think that's just a pressure of being a high performing EDM act in, in, in Avicii, where you're you've got so many different um, forces that are kind of compelling you to sit in the studio and create and create. You're flying from place to place, playing in front of hundred thousand people, and it's a fairly lonely and insular kind of profession in that regard. Especially if you don't have you know your family and friends around with you who can maybe take time off work and just travel with you to in the middle of the week to las vegas it can be very isolating but i can imagine i don't i don't but again i don't know what the motivation would be for somebody at jack master level to get that wasted at your party maybe it's just a, a way of dealing with the fame maybe it's just another internal struggle but that's just way too much isn't it like imagine yeah bloody hell i didn't know it was that bad um and again, this idea of always stopping around a certain date is always a misnomer. If you want to stop something, diet, you want to start working out, you want to stop eating bad food, you want to stop going out, you want to not indulge in that, indulge in this, you just have to start today. You can't make this future day of what the next morning I wake up and everything changes. No, it has to start today. It doesn't have to start on a Monday or a Saturday, it has to start today. And it, it does and there's always and today's always the wrong time. Oh, if I do it next week, I've got a wedding coming. I've got, there's always, there's never going to be a perfect time to start anything or to make that kind of drastic a change. You have, to, you have to start whenever you say you're going to start and then kind of just hold on tight. It's going to be a rough ride and then kind of see yourself through the rocky waters. And as soon as you get on the other side, that's when you start realizing, oh, okay, this makes more sense. Um, it continued here. After his 30th, Ravel stopped taking drugs for a while but ended up relapsing. The night of the assault was supposed to be another last big night before getting clean again. His girlfriend at the time had given him an ultimatum. It was either her or the GHB. Was his girlfriend Peggy Goo at the time? Because I'm pretty sure they were together, right? And now she's with that photographer, dude. I'm not too sure. So he says in, in, he intended to finish up the last of his stash and be done with it. As it turned out, that night would be the last time it took GHB. As Ravel uh, explains all of this to me, he keeps re returning to the centre facts. He repeats like a mantra. I chose to put the bottle of GHB to my lips. This is all my fault. Which again, only commended for that one. Ravel didn't face any legal consequences for his actions. Shortly after the festival, he arranged to meet with the victims and the festival to offer a face-to-face -face apology and discuss how to move forward. During that meeting, he offered to hand himself over to police, but the victim said that he didn't feel that was necessary. So credit to him and credit to the girls involved for like, you know, again, I'm, I'm sure... I would always I would always lean more towards the believing the victims and also believing them when they say they've forgiven the guy. If they say it's cool and it's fine, they've looked him in the ball of his eyes and seen that he's absolutely remorseful and maybe it was an outer character thing. Maybe previously he's gotten messed up, but he hasn't gone that far. He's gone on it and he's getting he's gotten wasted, but he hasn't gone that far. And this is the one occasion where he's kind of gone a bit too far and overslept his mark credit to them uh during that meeting he offered them so to police they said he felt a public apology detailing events 
as they happened was in order. Revelle agreed and gave a detailed statement to resident advisors in August 2018. In the May of this year, he posted another statement on his Facebook page in which he talked about how he had been significant changes to major address destructive parts of his lifestyle by taking an extended period out, which is great. So far, time served has, be, has come in the form of self-imposed time out or cancelled career, depending on how you look at it. Definitely cancelled. I think if you if you see the amount of time he's apologised, the amount of time he's trying to be remorseful, I think behind the scenes, he's definitely not been... I think he hasn't been... His agents and managers probably haven't been getting the calls that they wanted. Maybe he's got dropped by his agent and manager. You have no idea what's happening in the industry. People are really hot and cold on you once you're the hot guy hot girl they're gonna jump on you and, and give you all the sets under the sun so suddenly as soon as you get cold and the public cancels you they will completely ditch you straight away so i'm sure behind the scenes some clubs and some promoters have been hesitant to kind of book him but hopefully now it kind of changes in his favor and when i ask reveal how long is enough until you can have his career back he tells me he's finding it very difficult to move forward people keep telling me to move on from this but it's on my mind all the time which again is another um, indication that he's generally sorry about what he done as we talk about the mechanics of getting his career back together he darts back and forth between the practicalities of what a fresh start would look like a rider with no booze on it and the guilt he feels about contemplating a second chance but it's weird though isn't it you know the louis ck thing he never really apologized in a very heartfelt way he didn't seem like he was that apologetic which i understand because maybe in his eyes he might see it as a consensual um, act between two people or between some adults he I think it's, the story goes, he requested if he could masturbate in front of these women. They said yes. And then when it happened, they got freaked out by it, which, you know, you're allowed to give permission and then suddenly not be on it anymore. That's perfectly fine. But he probably feels in his head, I did nothing wrong. Everyone knows I've got this kink. I asked these girls if I could do it. They said yes. And now suddenly they're turning back on it and they're trying to make it seem as if I'm Harvey Weinstein. I get it in, in um, Lucy K's point of view. But the interesting fact about it, he was able to just get back on stage himself like he just did it like he went up on stage a couple of times and now he's putting on his own tour so i guess if you're jack master you could wait for the industry to give you permission to come back into the scene or you could just put your own money up and just throw a party and say look this is a i don't know a party that all the money raised goes towards this charity in order to kind of drug awareness i don't know where have you frame it right but you could do it that way and then see what the public says because ultimately i think enough time has elapsed where most people have either forgotten about this story or just don't care especially when the main victims of the story have forgiven him with the, the main two girls of the story the festival itself who are embarrassed and probably ashamed by his behavior have said you know what let bygones be bygones you're completely sorry about it you've taken a year out more than a year you've gone to therapy you've done some introspective work you've looked inside yourself you try to make some changes and if inevitably you have fallen and other people in your industry have also acted silently without acknowledging that they had an issue without saying it out loud i'm pretty sure a lot of people in these friendship group i've seen it with my own eyes have kind of settled down and chilled out from all the heady stuff they were doing so he's essentially been a martyr in that respect for everybody else in the industry to see that look this is how far you can go don't take it this far so i guess if he did throw his own part he'd be perfectly fine but probably doesn't want to do it but i think a lot of it is more to do with him I think he's struggling himself to kind of put himself out there and be in front of people because he doesn't want somebody, he doesn't want to be on stage and have some girl just stand there with two middle fingers up looking at him, staring in the eyes. You know what I mean, he probably feels, he, he probably doesn't, he's not enough of a scumbag to just go about life um, having people heckle him in the streets and be okay with it. It would hurt him, right? Especially since he's he's always been the kind of dude who was essentially the people's champ, I would say, in DJing wise. He's sim similar to like a scream. People are, ro are rooting for him to do well. Um, he's always kind of a jovial, fun dude, always willing to take pictures, sign things, just give people the time of day. So to kind of go from that and suddenly be the villain is probably messing with his head a lot. Um, it continues here. Um, I've always, uh, da, 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 as we talk about the mechanics of getting his career back, da, 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 I've always wanted to stand against misogyny and I've always been vocal about it in the music industry. After after what's happened, I feel like I'm not able to stand for those causes because it's a hypocrite and people will just laugh at me out of the town, which is true, isn't it? When you're that, when you're that, when you're that forceful male feminist kind of dude and you suddenly get involved in this sort of stuff, it does seem a bit wild when you suddenly start, you know, you know. Um, but that, 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 that's part and parcel of the thing, isn't it? You're going to lose some things in this issue. Taking time off uh, reveals uh, space to pick through the layers of complicated feelings this situation brought up for him. Much of what has been 
he's been doing this year has involved introspection he's gone to therapy and aa and has done the hoffman project which is that self-help thing right an intensive personal development program whose alumni include goldie and gq editor dylan jones he tells me the substance abuse got worse as his career got bigger the more plaudits he collected the harder he f he found being the dj i've always just felt like i found myself at these big shows that i'm not really ready to feel which, you know, is true. It must be hard, isn't it? Going from being a real, a local legend to suddenly filling arenas and doing festivals is just nutty, isn't it? Um, I think the worst I saw him was a video with him and Peggy actually playing in, um, I think on Friday 909. That's the worst I saw him. I think, okay, this guy is completely wasted behind the decks. But somehow, again, the, elite, the elites of the elites are just able to turn it in, isn't it? It was still a fairly decent set. Um, it's the best job in the world, being a DJ. I've always thought that um i've always uh, thought that to admit that was was i wasn't having the best of times or to ask for help was a big uh was a bit get the violins out kind of thing we also talk about his mother who died of alcohol related uh, complications when 14 which must be hell for him to kind of think about he's kind of going down the same path i've betrayed her memory and i feel like i've let her down <sighs> heavy shit man it's difficult to reveal to say but he's doing all the work in part because he wants his job back he loves music it's been his outlet since childhood at the same time he only wants his career back if it's on the right terms with the victims there's no handbook for this but then again they, they, that's, that's what i'm saying i think he has to forgive himself now and just move on with it he's given a lot they're giving too much weight to the court of public opinion if the victims themselves have forgiven you they've moved on it's up to now the industry the people that actually can book you to decide whether or not to book you or not and if they don't want to book you it's up to him too to put some money up and throw his own event and do it that way and kind of work his way back in the industry that way because honestly i'm pretty sure a lot of people would be willing and happy to have him back on the scene because as heinous as the crime was that he'd done no one can deny that he's missed man he's definitely missing the musical landscape i miss having him around i miss hearing his tunes I miss the amount of stuff he goes through. Like him and Scream are the same level of, you know, music nerdness. The stuff they go through in their sets week in, week out are just insane. I miss getting his tune ideas and it's just, I mean, his sets on YouTube and stuff. We miss him having him on a set, on a scene, man. Honestly, we, we, it'd be good to have him back. Um, but he has to forgive himself, honestly, because again, the victims have forgiven him and he just has to kind of accept that and hope that the industry does. If they don't, put you on an event and go from there. As the Me Too movement um, moves into a new phase, the article continues, one, one in which we have to live with what comes after the allegations. Men who've been accused haven't figured out a way to apologise properly. And as a society, we haven't figured out who to let back in and on which terms. Harvey Weinstein um, continues to deny the allegations against him. Some like Louis C.K. and Neil deGrasse Tyson, who have apologised, have been criticised for doing it terribly. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson did it quite well, I think. Um, he completely took the time out, let the investigation continue, and for, for, for the most part... Whilst the investigation was happening into his sexual assault charges, he completely stayed out of the public light. You know, mostly due to the advice of his agents and representation, I'm assuming, but, but mostly because it made more sense as soon as the allegations got denied. He went back onto the front foot and now he's everywhere, right? The first Nudogast Tyson appearance on JRE was a bit of a calamity. You could tell he was quite pent up and quite defensive, but, you know, for the most part, he did quite well. Lucy K, like I said previously, was a bit hit and miss his apology. Um, if anything, maybe Kevin Spacey one was the one that was a bit weird. But again, it's just, there's no handbook or no playbook or steps for people to get reintegrated. So I think sometimes when you get accused of it, you don't know what, where to go because there's not been a good example so far of people reintegrating themselves back into society when they made a mistake. Because again, it's cancel culture. The reason why these people say cancel culture is because effectively, I think like, yeah, yeah it, it comes from a good place. I think for the most part, women have suffered in this entertainment circles, you know, being the object of people's desire and abuse and all that sort of nonsense, right? So that now they're very sensitive to anything happening again to them in that regard. So if it happens again, they don't even want to give you a chance to redeem yourself because they think you are the rot. That's you're, you're basically rotten to the core. You can't redeem yourself. You can't. It's like, you know, it's rotten plasterboard. You can't just take a bit of it out. You have to rip the whole thing down. So once they cancel you and put new plus board up, they're hoping those guys are going to be more well behaved. But there are some occasions where some people are have honestly made an honest mistake or just have overstepped the mark and done wrong. And in in the societies gone by, there was always a path for redemption. You'd always get chucked out of the village or shamed out of the village, but there was always a path for you to come back and earn people's trust again. And of course, there has to be a limit to it, but there has to be a route back to redemption. There has to be because, you know, none of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes, not to the extent that he has done or other people have done, but we're going to make errors some way. We have to have a, a path back that allows us to kind of reintegrate back to society because if we're without our community, who are we? Do you know what I mean? If, for instance, somebody, God forbid, gets shamed or gets accused of sexual assault and they can't 
forgive themselves and end up taking their life we have to all be responsible for that because we haven't given them the opportunity to redeem themselves in any way shape or form um the article continues here rather than let the court of opinion decide who's served enough time perhaps the best parameter we have is that the victims of abuse themselves feel reveals victim declined to be interviewed specifically for this story and insisted issued a statement the position of the festival and its staff who were affected by Jack's behavior on the night is that Jack is directly apologized to them. He's taken time out of work for himself and undertaken to never repeat this behavior towards anyone else in the future. He has our staff and special support in working towards these aims and his own future happiness. Amazing. That's, that should be it, basically. Um, on the few occasions that Reveal has been to the club in last year, men have come up to him and told him that what he did wasn't too bad, something they've seen happening in the club every Friday night, which obviously isn't the best advice. It's really important for me not to go, thanks, man. Yeah, no, that's not what happened because it was it, it was that bad. It was, it was fucking out of order, he says. It's the kind of attitude that's stopping us from making progress. He says that in order for him to, the culture, in order, in order, he says that in order for the culture that normalizes his behavior to change, men need to stand up and admit wrongdoing. Every woman knows another woman who's been raped or sexually assaulted, which is also obvious. No, every man knows another man who's gone through honest and says that they've made the done that. The world's realized this past year. That occupying the higher echelons of the dance music industry means that taking responsibility as a role model, what he's found a lot harder, however, is accepting that his own fans might be part of the problem. Yeah, that is always the issue, isn't it? When your fans come, sometimes you can't. He- <sighs> Who said it recently? No name, right? She hates that all her fans are white. She makes music specifically for a particular black audience, but all her fans happen to be white college kids. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you hate your own fans. Sometimes that's why I've heard comedians say they'll say a joke and then they'll get a type of they'll get a certain person come up to them after the event that they don't want to be associated with so they'll completely bin that joke they just don't want to go down that route because it's going to attract a certain kind of audience and i guess for jack massa he's probably got a kind of laddie dude who kind of you know fumbles all the time and is excused for his behavior and you know is you know essentially pretty toxic in their masculinity and he definitely isn't that guy he just got way too fucked up and overset the mark on that one occasion or maybe several occasions but he's not the dude that perpetually goes out every friday night looks to get wasted so he can excuse himself to touch up people's bums and stuff that's not what he wants to attract so man oh man that's that's the hard bit isn't it how do you get those fans the hell away from you um there's definitely a big section of my fan base that would feel under the lad culture banner he says in her statement on ra last year one of the victims said the response to initial statement was sickening she said the fact that that hijacked by untruths and, and lad humor is symbiotic a uh, symptomatic story of the uk culture in a wider sense and highlights why it's so important for jack to clarify what happened for a long time i've not been projecting positive messages revo says if there's going to be any change it has to all start with for men men have to be prepared to check their matters check their mat their mates when they make even the mildest of misogynic comments which is true not your behavior anyway i think as a group of lads going out and like, you have to check your friends and make sure they're not behaving in a bad way but in general you know sometimes mob behavior mob rule once one person is doing something you feel a bit out of order or out of, you feel a bit weird coming up and saying something you just partake or you be silent and that's not the way to go with things um i also think in general like i've said i honestly do think that since he got since he since this happened to, to jack master i feel like everyone else in the scene especially his kind of close circle of friends the, that kind of tech house crew for the lad for the loose for you know to roughly describe them has kind of got their affairs in order and probably pretty much you know settled themselves down for the most part it's the best thing to do because you know as much as people take the piss out of that tech house crew they do put on fun parties everyone seems to have a good time you know you're really waste you're really kind of um, risking it all for what a, a little group here and there with someone that doesn't want, want it to happen there are numerous amounts of groupies out there that will be more than willing and happy to receive the sexual advances of people like jack master there's no need to kind of throw it under the bus just to kind of you know um enact your power or influence or dominance of people that don't want it or you know people, especially people in the industry i figured i always feel like that's the way you overstep the mark when it's somebody when it's a peer or somebody in the industry that you're you're doing it and they're kind of hustling the same way so a female it's a fellow female dj there should be a kind of brotherhood between you where there's not that line is always kind of drawn in the sand where they can always feel comfortable around you and they know that when they see you on the stage or when they see you on the lineup they know they've got like a kind of um uh, a brother in arms that they can kind of uh, rely on if things get a bit hairy um, and again, there's always a, there's there's a plethora every industry, whether it's flipping, you know, authors to poets to you know hockey players. Everyone has groupies who are more than willing and happy to you know um, exchange sexual favors in order to kind of get behind the booth. There's no need to kind of you know do it to people that don't want it in that regard. Um, 
there's, there's, there for a long time I, i've been putting message um if you've been yeah so yeah it's a really long article or no pretty short article check it out if you're that way inclined uh it's called jack master saw my thought jack master breaks his silence on on vice magazine i'll link it in the show notes for you guys to check out if you want to check out yourself as well but definitely recommend check it out and again support jack master man send him words with kind of i think he's i think he's okay i think he's fine i forgive him i think he's, the victim has forgiven him which is the main thing and now he can move on with his career and go from there i would say in my opinion but again what do i know in it what do i know what else is next on the list here oh lena white interview here from the globe magazine which is fairly interesting we should speak about that a little bit um it's interesting the kind of backlash lena waif is getting right from the masters of none and a few other bits she's done she always seen a bit of like of the darling of the you know black hollywood i'll say in that regard but somehow in the last couple of months she's not been the flavor of the month especially on black twitter i think the main reason has been because of her response to the whole jason mitchell controversy he was another guy embroiled in some sexual harassment claim and she essentially didn't want to say anything i think she did a she did a bit of an oopsie by commenting and not commenting i think she just should have said flat out look this guy's my friend i worked with him on set it's i don't i don't feel like i can be objective in this issue so i'm going to decline and not comment on it i should actually have been completely fine but she tried to explain herself around it and kind of rationalize and intellectualize the issue when you know essentially this guy jason mitchell did a bad thing people accused him for it and she remained silent for the most part and her being a female in hollywood people looked at it as if you know she was kind of just um not being a, what they call it uh an ally in the fight against sexual harassment but she's something quite illuminating on this interview that has been received the wrong way on social which has been interesting but i thought was fairly evident and fairly you know a normal thing that a lot of black people would really identify with but you know here we go this interview is with um, the Globe and Mail, and it's titled Lena Waif and Mil- Melina Matsukas, Matsukas, right, on Queen and Slim, this new movie that she's put out now that's been receiving mixed reviews. I think, you know, what's said, Black, Twi- uh, Black Twitter said it's horrible, and people on Instagram are saying it's amazing, so, you know, you probably have to watch it yourself and make your own opinion about it. But it says, uh, being black is beautiful, but it's also traumatizing, is the headline. But this first couple of questions are the ones that I really want to highlight on that kind of i would say i identify with and i think a lot of people would identify with even if they don't identify with her as a person they would say that this is a true statement you know of the black diaspora as i like to term it in the united states and also this is another indication that we should probably stop with the identity politics and stop kind of grouping ourselves because this is another case of the e of the left eating the left right eating itself in the case of like how woke can you be um how much identity can you ascribe to your success and how far you re- really willing to go in order to kind of represent your culture and it should never be like that it should just be about you know again re- representation is important um, making sure you have a voice in the room is important but also the idea of getting on with your work and just being good at what you do is also important so that you appeal to the, a mass number of people not just one group of people um i think now we're at the stage where black movies are being made um they're not probably being made at the rate that we'd like them but they are being made but they should be now be made for the wider public not just for black audiences because that's the only way we're going to be able to make more because you know by and large unless you're living in africa for the most part most black people are the minority in most western countries so by that very reason you're going to need other people who are non-black to support the movie in order to kind of allow the production company to see that oh this movie is making money to then give you more money to make more movies because as surface and as ignorant and as naive and as unaware as some of these production companies are the one thing they do listen to is money if you make money in the box office they'll give you more chances if you don't make more money they don't care how noble your cause is it's going to go down and why and that's why you're seeing a lot of these movies like charlie's angels uh the batwoman uh tv series are suffering because essentially they're only around they only exist because they serve to perpetuate some kind of political agenda they don't they're not there to just merely kind of slightly represent you know a different face in kind of superhero movies or in kind of female cinema or in kind of the male dominated cinema industry fair enough they're there mostly to serve a political agenda but they should be there to kind of represent women and also primarily to tell a good story that's what it should be it should be 10 percent representation look look at this diverse cast we got the woman's the leading actress is asian that guy is this the the, the fair but then the most of the reason why I should watch your show is because it's a good show, standardly. It shouldn't just be because it's a, a, sh- a TV program or a cinema movie that kind of bashes men. That's why people should watch it because that can only go so far. Uh, but this interview, going back to this interview, this real quote kind of stuck out to me. And again, I, I kind of, 
related to it. But a lot of black people on people on black Twitter didn't really take it uh, that way at all, and I've now kind of burying Lena, and she's now become the enemy of the people, which is very interesting to see. It's the following. Um, um, uh, the, question, the interview asks the following I know you've both worked together in the past can you tell me what draws you both to continue to collaborate um, Matt Circus says the following I tend to like works that are by writer directors and I'm very much not a writer and Lena will tell you herself that she's not a director to find someone who can write in your tongue who can translate your values onto the page that brings such poetry to their work every time that's able to straddle the lines between genres and be able to create something political but at the same time entertaining and commercial which again is very difficult to do and again I don't really again I think we're moving away from the whole political theme um, agenda driven movies especially ones that are primarily directed by people of color or as whatever you may term it and now we're slowly but surely getting towards a point where we're going to start doing just movies for movies sake not you know no more slave movies no more movies about you know um white guilt none of that sort of stuff just great movies that happen to have a very diverse cast that aren't just you know your quintessential white superhero movie that's where we should be heading towards and hopefully with the more success these ladies have and other directors have we're going to see that happen more often um Da, 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 political but at the same time entertaining and commercial that's who i am and that's who i am as an artist if i had a pen if i had a talent it would be this woman wave answers the following um i don't think i could be a director that melena is she's a combination of so many things even racially the fact that she's black she's greek she's cuban all these things make her such a specific storyteller and what else i love about melania melina sorry is that she can be the at the hood party and vibe she can also be in the front row at gucci and milan and know more about the designs and the influences at that's coming down the runway than half of the people at the front row i don't have that gift although i'm gifted in my own way i've seen all about eve more times than anyone can imagine and also can obsess over my best friend's wedding and love jones and then watch and just another girl on irt all in the same day and get the same joy and fulfillment from those works i think that's the reason why my voice is so weird and confuses people sometimes because i study sorkin spike lee and spike jones and that makes me a little different than a person who only has black influences i guess people took that the wrong way right as if she's trying to say black influences are just quite based but i don't think it is i think it's just the idea that she's representing a different kind of voice in the black cinema world right it's probably different to um has her black experience different to tyler perry's black experience which is why I don't ascribe to these ideological um, identity politics based arguments and motives when it comes to creating or putting yourself out there. I think for the most part, representation is important. I guarantee you that part of the reason why I love Steve McQueen is because he's a black dude. I didn't know who he was previously. I remember watching the review show on BBC when I used to live at home. I was obsessed with that, watching all those programs. And he happened to be one of his first, I think, exhibitions of the one where it's a cowboy kind of repeated. I think he's doing one of the exhib- a retrospective, actually. Yeah, I think it's. Um, Steve McQueen retrospective I remember seeing that on the culture show and then being engrossed by him following him on interviews and stuff and then by just him representing something that I hadn't seen before in contemporary art being a, a black man a straight black dude for instance I then dug deep and found out he was an amazing gifted artist and directing his own right but he wasn't necessarily pushing himself to me as a black director he was just pushing himself to on TV as Steve McQueen right and then you dig in deeper and you find out oh shit he's actually amazing what he does and i think that's where we should be as a culture should be as a race because i think we both we all represent too many different varying levels of experiences and and in life i could say for myself like i grew up in ends i grew up with people who have you know been sentenced to 30 years in prison but i was i was i used to play on the road but i wasn't from the road i wasn't you know i wasn't doing bits i wasn't doing moves um i wasn't doing that stuff i didn't I never jacked anyone i might have been around when it was happening but i wasn't egging it on i wasn't part of the process whatever right so that is a different experience to a guy that was actually like selling day in day out on the strip on the corner do you know what i mean like pushing stuff like going up county lines going country all that sort of stuff that wasn't what i was doing but i know people that was doing it so my experience is different i went to you know a prestigious university um I'm, you know, if I read most of the times, I, re- I write different things. I'm interested in different topics, whatever it may be. But it's I'm st- it's still a voice in a black community. It's not it's not the voice. It's a different voice, and I guess that's what we all different represent. But the best way that we can push ourselves forward is by kind of uniting under that umbrella, saying that we all have different various different influences and different sort of experiences, and then kind of presenting that, relaying that back into our work. The worst thing you can do is maybe try and pretend like you're from the road, especially if you're a black person, just because you feel like you want to connect with your community and then put something out that's terrible. You have to speak from your point of experience. That's it. 
and then hope that just by you representing yourself in the truest possible sense, you're then going to then inspire a whole generation of people looking up at you based on your skin color. But then once they dig in deeper, like I did with Steve McQueen, they realize, oh, you're just amazing. And then we kind of uplift each other that way. Because I think if we start eating each other alive and start saying, oh, what she's trying to say, that black people are base and that she's more cultured because she used to watch all this stuff, all about the family, that's not the way we should go about stuff. Let's just, let's just understand that Lena's black experience is different from your black experience, but it's in the human experience, as are all humans. You don't, you don't expect to see all, I don't, I, you know, you couldn't get more, you couldn't get two different white people if you tried putting an English person and a Russian person together. They're, mo they're both physically might look the same, fair skin, light eyes, straight hair, but they're both completely different human beings. Family values, uh, the way they carry themselves, Whatever it may be, they're completely different, but they look completely similar, right? Same with some black people. Like, it's, you, you hear a lot of times when people go back to Africa, they always say um, Africans can spot Europeans from a mile off, right? Straight away. Why is it? Like, there is a difference between a, a European, a European black person and an African black person. The same would have to say with an African American and African. Like, they're probably, they're probably more different than maybe a Geordie, uh, Jersey, Shore, a Jersey Shore girl and somebody from Sicily, right? They're, they're, they're on paper might be Italian, right? But you know maybe influences and life experiences wise they couldn't be more different but they both represent a particular kind of community and they're both doing different bits and pieces and exposing the world to different sides of their community in order to kind of further bring everyone up and i think that's where we should be so again i don't really see a problem with this whole quote i know it might rub people up the wrong way but it's a it's a truth isn't it like we've all grown up with people like i've you know i was a big example of it where most of my life i spent especially in school, in secondary school, I was always in the higher sets, especially in my school because, it, you know, it's full of delinquents. Most of the delinquents in my school happened to be the kids that were black or happened to be the kids that were Asian or whatever it may be, right? So most of my classes where I was in the higher sets, I happened to be surrounded by people who were Asian and white. So most of my Asian and white friends were into different kind of bits of music, which exposed me to that side of things. But then when I went and played football or I went out on a weekend and we went to go try draw girls in Ilford and Romford, it was mostly with all my black friends. So I had those two different worlds that I was kind of straddling every time i was in school so on one side i was listening to limp biscuit and the other side i was listening to grime every single day and that was what i kind of carried into my adulthood these kind of but i think that's what makes me special that's what makes me an interesting person that i'm able to kind of have these different levels of interest at the same level not that i'm trying to play up to one side no these were things i was doing i was going to deja vu i was um you know recording sets on my mix on my flipping uh, tape recorder i was making my own sets i was trying to mc i was djing i was doing all this stuff and i was also going to metal concerts or listening to stuff or watching people live and whatever it may be or skateboarding whatever it may be all those kind of quintessential quote-unquote white things i was doing too because i was there in varying levels of influence and if i was making movies then you would see that in the movie that I make. You'd see that in the work that I produce. It would be it, it would be tangible. You, it would be it would kind of jump off the screen, jump off the canvas. You can see it straight away. Okay, cool. This guy's got different levels of interest that he's coming up with, and, and it's no it's no more better than a person that's just come from quote unquote black culture. It's no more different. It's just a it's no more be, it's no better than that. It's just a different way of expressing it. I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think again, like I said, we can't eat ourselves if we want to get further as a culture as a race as a community we have to kind of unite and allow each part of the community to represent themselves in the truest possible way and not be shamed into thinking no you're not black enough you're not you're not whatever enough that isn't the right way to go about things um and again just to end it here matsuka spirits the following i think that speaks directly to the black experience right we're not a monolithic group which i said we are multicultural in the truest sense of the form we're all connected by blackness our roots are slavery and very much africa and that it translates different ways depending on where people landed but we're all connected and this film speaks to the african diaspora and all the ways in which we see it yeah so i love that man i really love that um and yeah and, and wave says this is probably my favorite episode of masters of none actually the thanksgiving one about the about how she's the def, different ways of coming out which are really cool the lebanese thing she says the following uh, melania and i melania and i always say to each other that it feels like we share the womb you know we feel like family and that's part of the reason that i think we bonded so quickly the thanksgiving episode of masters of none which a lot of people gravitate towards was a moment that was so eye-opening the way people reacted to it was like whoa what did we do here Talk it, talking, Masuka says, following, taking that episode and being able to watch, uh, being able to work with this story uh, that I had never seen on television before, a black lesbian mum coming out to her mum and black girl growing up in New York. I knew that part. That was me. So I could see myself um, in parts of her story, even if it wasn't mine. And that's how I feel about all the characters that she writes. And it's the same thing that Queen and Slim, Queen and Slim is all of us. 
while I was writing this film, I just knew that Melania had to direct it. Okay, anyway, but definitely, definitely worth checking it out. It's a really cool interview. I'll link it again in the show for you guys to see. Queen of Slim, I think, is out now in cinema. Support them and check them out. They're doing they're doing great work and really trying to push culture forward. Okay, that's an hour of the Excellent Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Episode number 264. As per usual, if you're watching via the YouTube, smash that like button, click subscribe, join another time. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the show. Any bits that you liked, any bits that you didn't like, let me know. All, all bets are off. All critics is good critique. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. People can find the show. And I'll see you guys again another day. For now, take care. If you cross the road, left, look left and right and make sure you hydrate. Peace. Take care. Bye.